Well, since it's a hot, maybe we should start. Anyway, thank you all for coming today to this Cornwall Library event on a beautiful Saturday, spring Saturday afternoon. We're here to talk about the ubiquitous podcasts. And I think what, you'll, what we want to talk about is both um, offer a primer for those of you who don't um, use podcasts. And for those of you who do, we have three active podcasters who are going to talk a little bit about what it's like to create um, what they do and kind of um, what they're after with their podcasts. So that's sort of our plan. And we'll, we'll, I'll introduce a few who will talk about the basics, um, Maggie and Carey, and then we'll move into the three of us. We'll give you some introductions of all of us. And then uh, we'll have a little conversation, we'll question and answer, and then we'll ask some questions to you guys. Sound all right? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, let me go right into introductions so you know who's up here on the stage. So, uh, Carrie, on you at the end. Am I doing it right? Am I following you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Carrie has worked in radio for most of her career at places like WNYC, PRX, and Audible. She particularly loves teaching people how to make podcasts. She ran the audio program at the Columbia Journalism School, developed an international training program with Google, and is now running a podcast fellowship at SUNY Stony. Her day job is with a small audio startup called Spooler, co-founded by fellow Cornwallian Henry Blodgett. Kurt Anderson, his most recent book is Evil Geniuses, The Making of America, companion volume to the prize-winning uh, prize Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, both of which were New York Times bestsellers. He's the author of four novels, has written for the stage and television, and contributes to the New York Times, The Atlantic, and other publications, and appears regularly as a commentator on MSNBC. Previously, he was a staff columnist and critic for Time, New York, and The New Yorker, was co-founder of the magazine Spy and editor-in-chief of New York. Kurt was also co-creator and for its 20-year run, the host of Studio 360, a weekly public radio show and podcast about culture that won two Peabody Awards. In 2021, he hosted, wrote, and co-produced the podcast Next in the Core. Emily McElroy has over 18 years of experience as an art advisor, independent curator and art educator. She was director of communications and education at the Brandt Foundation Art Study Center, where she worked on blockbuster exhibitions, including Andy Warhol, Dwayne Schnabel, and Nate Lohman. She has also lectured at top New York City museums, including Whitney and Metropolitan Museum of Art. Most recently, Emily has curated multiple exhibitions with leading emerging artists, and is now host and CEO of the Art Career Podcast. Kimberly Cutter is a journalist, novelist, and the former executive editor of Harper's Bazaar and the former West Coast editor for W. She is the author of the critically acclaimed novel, The Maid, and has written for many publications, including The Wall Street Journal, The Telegraph, Elle, Vanity Fair, Mary Claire, and Vogue.com. Kim is also the creator and host of the podcast, The Control Variable, American Propaganda. She lives in the Hudson Valley. Meg Tansy is a nonprofit strategist with a long standing interest in the power of stories to build community. She is currently the director of development for the National Book Foundation, presenter of the National Book Awards. Meg has raised millions of dollars for nonprofit and political organizations, including StoryCorps on NPR's Morning Edition and Brooklyn's Billy Holiday Theater. She has helped launch multiple sector wide initiatives that have regranted millions of dollars to soup kitchens and food pantries, black theaters, and literary arts nonprofits. And then I was an assistant at Paris Review in the late 1970s, as well as a writer and editor and ad sales rep at Andy Warhol's Energy Magazine in the 1980s for seven years, but was still published at The Factory. I'm the author of Nancy Lancaster, The World, Her Life, Her Art, published by Knopf, and have written for several magazines, including Grand Title, The Paris Review, Telegraph, L, Hyperallergic Art Forum, and the New Criterion. Currently, I'm writing a history of the Americanization of Hawaii for Kanaf, and I'm board president of the Merwin Conservancy, the Maui House and Palm Garden, belonging to the late National Book Award winner, 
uh, and U.S. Poet Laureate W.S. Merlin. And I'm on the board of Cornwall Library, which I'm very proud of. So that's us. I'd like to turn it over to you guys to tell us what podcasts are. Hey, welcome. Come on in. Uh, so this is so exciting. Thank you so much for showing up today. And uh, most of my career, a bunch of things I've done, I've been basically trying to evangelize about audio storytelling and why uh, it's good to make audio storytelling and now podcasts. So I was going to start out with this. Um, go. So this is just a bit of research that I have really liked uh, from this guy, Yuri Hassan, who's at Princeton, and it's doing fMRI research on the brain, trying to understand how we appreciate language and know stories. And uh, what he learned in the research early on was that when the brain image of someone listening to someone speaking is mirrored, uh, when they understand what's actually being said. Like if you, it's not just the listening, if you're listening to somebody who speaks a language you don't understand, it doesn't mirror in the same way. But when you're actually listening to someone speak a language that you know and tell a story, it actually changes your brain and it really sits with you. So it's one of the things I, I often teach people how to make podcasts and making podcasts is not easy, as I think is one of the things that we learn. They sound very easy, but they're often difficult to make. But I think what's, um, what's the reason to do it is that these stories often really stick with you. They stay with you. You may already have in your mind, like, a driveway moment or some st audio story that you heard on the radio or you heard in a podcast that just stuck with you that you stayed in the car to finish. It just when you think back on it, it really is kind of vivid in a way. There's a way that I think listening is so valuable because you're sort of invited to co-create with the person who's making the story. So as an uh, audio enthusiast, I just want to like start with that point overall. We wanted to work on the assumption today that maybe people are curious about podcasts but haven't listened. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some barriers to listening. And so this is a fairly charming video. I still think it's charming and I'm sort of surprised there haven't been more of it. It's from 2014, uh, just about when Serial was getting launched, which we'll talk about more. This is Ira Glass, the host of This American Life with his friend, Mary, uh, basically explaining how to listen to a podcast. And so we will bring this back today. And you. Okay, ready to go? I thought you were starting. All right, I'll start. I'll start. Oh, do you, hi. Do you, do you, hi. Um, I'm Ira Glass. I'm Mary, Irish friend. And I'm here because we're starting a new podcast. It is the first spin off show from our program. We're very excited. It's called Serial. And uh, we've come to learn that many of you do not know how to get a podcast. And we thought, like, well, we have to show you how to get a podcast because it's not very hard. And I thought I asked you to come here today. Mary. Because I know how to do it. Not only do you know how to do it, but you do it every week, right? Of course. Yeah. Every week. Every yeah. week for your show. I don't need to give away your age, but is it safe to say you are an actual older person? I'm on the dark side of 85. How's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Mary, so, so why don't you explain to us how, how, to, how, to, how to do it, how to get a podcast? Oh, first thing you do is go to the website. That you know. That's right. Most of you, I, I have to say, you, you surely can get yourself to a website. Let's give the web address right now. When you get there, this is what you will see on the screen. And there's a little arrow over there. You press it. And congratulations, you're listening to a podcast. Couldn't be easier. And it also works on your phone. This is the Serial website. See this little arrow, you push the arrow, you're listening to a podcast. Now, if you want to download a podcast to your tablet or to your phone, what you do is that you can basically just get an app that'll do all the work for you. It's super simple. If you have an iPhone, there's an app called Podcasts. Couldn't be easier. The name of the app is Podcasts. Get on that app and then you subscribe to Serial or any podcast you want. And uh, basically what it does is that it delivers every new podcast right there on your phone. You don't have to do anything after that. You do it once, you're all set. Um, if you have uh, an Android device, you can try one called Stitcher. That's a good one to start with. And basically, again, you look for the name of the podcast you like. Serial Podcast will be our new show. This American Life is our old show. And, uh, and then it does all the work for you. Try it. It's wonderful. It's a whole new world. I love it. All right. Yeah, I do. I truly do. It's opened up so much for me. Hi. 
<laughs> there you go. All right. Well, that video hopefully was like a little bit uh, early, but most of this is still true. That was in 2014. Serial came out on October 3rd, 2014, and really changed the game. And basically, and I'll explain a little bit more about why, but it sort of made the moment in time that we're, it's why we're, many people are talking about podcasts today. But I actually often start by, and I'm just going to do this for a little bit. I train people to make podcasts. I just finished a year long course. I'm not going to put you through that much of it, but I wanted to hit a couple of like kind of key points. I think they're interesting. Um, but my husband is in the back and he'll tell me if I'm going too long. So <laughs> um, so the first thing is like people think like, what is a podcast? It's getting even murkier now because there's a lot of YouTubers who are getting into podcasts and things like that. But if you just think fundamentally, a podcast is on-demand audio that you get over the internet. On-demand meaning it's whenever you want to listen to it. You can start it at any point. I think that's sort of the fundamental definition that I've been working with. So probably everyone, uh, it's true statistically, everyone has listened to the radio and still continues to listen to the radio fairly often. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what's similar about these two things, because there's a lot that's in common, but there are things that are different too. So the thing about podcasts, they are on demand, as I just said. I, we've always said that radio is a very companionable and very intimate medium. It is the kind of thing you listen by yourself. Typically, it's not so easy to have a conversation with someone and listen to the radio. Um, so it is something that you often take with you. It keeps you, you know, a uh, companion on a car trip or whatever. But it also has that intimacy that you sort of feel that someone's talking to you directly. I say podcasts are like intimacy and companionability on a higher scale even because you can start these uh, programs whenever you want. And you can listen, you can become quite those parasocial relationships where you feel quite connected uh, to your podcast host. They're in your ear, literally going with you about your life and, uh, and you can become quite close to them. It's one of the things I love about it, actually. They're really good at humanizing complex stories. A lot of podcasts are kind of like going into deep dives of moments of time and history or segments of uh, politics or art or, you know, like if you really like anything, basically, there's a podcast about it and uh, you can really get like very deep on certain topics, which is another thing I love about them. There's an abundance of niches. Uh, we'll talk about that too. Like if you, I just looked, uh, we were thinking, oh, there's going to be some farming a podcast from this area. So I Googled like Northeast farming podcast. There are several, I have a list. We're gonna send everyone who's signed up for this a list of podcast recommendations because actually, and as someone who works in the industry, it is the hardest thing is just what they call discoverability, like finding out about new podcasts. You may be interested in listening to a podcast and you don't know where to begin. So we're gonna give you a list of some of the most popular and some of the ones that we like, um, but just know if really genuinely, if you care about anything, there's podcasts. Um, and I find them really great because they bond and deepen communities, which matters to me a lot as a maker, but it means when people have live shows, like if any of our guests have live shows, people come to it and they feel quite like excited often because they feel really personally connected to this podcast. Um, they can be natively global. I like that as a one of someone who grew up we're making radio, which is somewhat bound by a transmitter, that podcasts can go anywhere in the world. Last summer, I taught a podcast class in South Africa with South African podcasters making their own podcasts. And it's so cool that the African podcasting is really up and coming, but you can, I can listen to their podcasts and they can listen to our podcasts. It's all very global. Um, if you want to get uh, think about making a podcast, it is free. And it's low barrier to entry. And I personally have always loved that people can make their own media and get up their own word. I love that. I love everything about that. So I really love podcasts. But it can be very daunting because at the moment there are over 5 million podcasts and there are over 70 million podcast episodes. So there's a lot of listening. If you're like, I want to listen to all the podcasts that are out there, you can't basically. But only about 700,000 of those are active. So still plenty for you to choose from. And that means that there's somebody who's published a podcast episode in the last month, I think. So. You might want to know how to listen to podcasts. <clears throat> Excuse me. As Ira Glass said, you can listen on Apple Podcasts. If you have an iPhone, you have an app that is native to the iPhone simply called podcast. You can search for that and off you go. You can basically subscribe to any podcast or now they use the term follow any podcast and it will come to be delivered to you directly. You can also use Spotify, which works on both your iPhone or an Android phone. Um, Spotify, you can listen at the free level of Spotify to a number of podcasts. Um, of course, if you, there's more, they're trying, Spotify has been buying a lot about podcasts. They're really going deep on it. So there'll be more coming from them. 
YouTube, similarly, there was a long time where podcasters would say, no, that's video, that's not us. And uh, But there are more podcasters getting into YouTube. Joe Rogan, should you ever be inclined to listen to Joe Rogan? He's got a big YouTube presence as well, um, in addition to his longstanding podcast. You can listen on Audible. Podcasts are a little bit hidden on the Audible device, but they actually have quite a few of them, and they're trying to give them to you as free content so that you'll pay uh, for the Audible membership. So, um, But there's some good stuff there. You can actually tell your Amazon Alexa or Google Smart um, Home, any smart home device, like, hey, uh, Alexa, play me the daily from the New York Times, for instance. And Stitcher is an app that is on Android um, as well, so if you need an Android app. I like to use this little map just to talk, because you might say, why is everyone talking about podcasts now? Why does it feel like the last 10 years or so, there's been just like, everybody's talking about a podcast, everybody has a podcast. My joke has been that my dentist keeps asking me how to start a podcast, like it's been such a thing. But basically the term podcasting started in 2003. All it was at that time, if you remember from blogs, they call these so like a RSS feed. It's the thing that allows you to subscribe and receive a blog delivered to you. All I did was add an MP3, like an audio file to that thing. And off we go, here we have podcasting, which means you can subscribe to something and have it delivered to you whenever there's a new episode released. Then in uh, got the name 2004, and in 2005 you had the first hit podcast that was Ricky Gervais, this comedy podcast. It was really it was like with really high numbers at the time, like 50,000 downloads, right? So then if you look, there's this like kind of flat, almost even a dip up until about this period, which is about the fall of 2014. And as you already know, Serial came out then, but something else happened, which I think is interesting. That's when the Apple Podcasts app became native on the iPhone. So it really took away a technological barrier, made it so easy all of a sudden. But the real thing that happened was you had something that people really wanted to listen to. And to this day, you know, Serial's first season is the, still the most downloaded uh, show in the world. And it's still like people are still finding it, which, uh, you know, there's so many things that have happened in the actual case. It's a sort of a true crime case about whether this 19 year old kid, when you, or you think he was 17 when, the, when his girlfriend was murdered and then he was convicted at age 19 for life in prison. So many twists and turns of what's happened to him since the podcast. but. It's still the most popular. And you can see, I, I need to update this slide, but it's basically been like what they call that hockey stick you know, growth since then. It's been really a lot. I follow these stats really closely. Once a year in March, this research company, Edison Research, released all this data about how people listen to audio and they do a little bit on podcasts. And um, you can see from the first bit that we basically have almost two thirds, 64% of the country has actually listened to a podcast. Um, from those, there's folks about 42% have listened to a podcast in the last month. We consider that pretty good in the biz. The number we care about the most is that folks have listened in the last week. That's somebody who's really got a habit of podcasting, and that's everyone was thrilled this year that it went over 30% for the first time. Um, there was also, so I'm going to come to this next stat, about 53% of those aged 12 to 54 are monthly podcast listeners. I would like, this is a serious throwdown to anybody 55 and older, like your numbers are low. You gotta get them <laughs> so, um, but the cool number at the bottom, I like this one because it's a, for the average, um, people who listen to podcasts, listen to about nine episodes a week. What I hear in that is that it's a lot. Um, but it's also that it's like, if you make a habit of listening, if you find time in your day, whether it's like a commute or for, I don't know, I listen all the time, but uh, when I'm walking my dog or I'm actually doing dishes or sometimes making dinner, I'm listening. So you kind of find that time in your life. And then once you do, there's like, you're more interested in getting a podcast. So I'm almost done, I promise, because it's a little, here's the stuff. But recently, knowing that there was sort of this drop off, if you see between the age, like here, this is a percentage of people who have listened to a podcast in the last month. And you can see actually going from right to left um, that, you know, there's from age 12 to 34, it's 55% of people, 35 to 54 is 51%. But look at that, would you, over 55 years old, there's only 21, only fifth of people over 55 years old have like listened to a podcast in the last month. So this is, like you can imagine, NPR, which is struggling all the time with the, the aging audience thinking like, huh, what, what's going to take? This is literally just research that came out in the last two months, I think. And, uh, you know, people are just, like trying to figure out if there's something to make. I thought I, there's a bunch of a whole side deck about this, but I pulled this out, which I thought was interesting for the age 55 and older listeners, what people are listening to. So good one. for me as a journalist, I'm so happy <clears throat> that the people of 55 and older are listening to news at this rate. 
I'm a little bit embarrassed for everyone else, but um, I think that the numbers are good. And now you, you might actually see, I feel like there was a question of making content that people want to listen to, which is always a question, but also redu reduce, continuing to reduce the technical barriers to getting a podcast. I think even just when, because we use the term subscribe to a podcast for so long, people thought you had to pay for a podcast. Most podcasts are free. There are a couple exceptions, but for the most part, it's a free medium you can listen and there's no obligation to anything. Like you can drop them the minute you want. So that's all the facts. I got a million more. You can ask me any questions, but I'll leave it there. So Meg's going to join me about meeting. I um, hi, thanks for coming out on this beautiful day to hear about podcasts. Um, I am a super enthusiastic uh, podcast civilian uh, and just wanted to talk a little bit about something that we started three years ago, which is uh, if you can think back to uh, three years ago, the spring, the spring of like hard lockdown, first spring of the pandemic when no one was going anywhere or seeing anyone. Um, the sense of time had sort of stopped. Uh, I had been listening to podcasts already for a while, and there was a new podcast coming out that I was very excited about um, by one of my favorite authors, and I thought, I can't wait to listen to this podcast, and I would love to, like, have some sort of something happening in my life weekly other than, like, dinner and disinfecting groceries and all the things we were doing that spring. Um, it was a podcast called Wind of Change. It's by um, the amazing author Patrick Bradley Keefe. Uh, it is a somewhat offbeat investigation into the question of if the CIA actually wrote the German metal band, the Scorpions hit song, Wind of Change, <laughs> in an effort to bring about the end of the Cold War. So that is, I can't tell you, it's everything up my alley. I'm, I'm still trying to get you all to listen to it, obviously. I mean, it's history, it's politics, it's pop culture, it's an investigation, it's an amazing storyteller. Um, so I wrote a bunch of friends who I thought would be game, and I said, guys, what if this podcast is coming out, and what if we listened to one episode a week when it was released, and then we met once a week somehow on Zoom and talked about it, um, and surprisingly and delightfully, they were all super game for this. Uh, some of them, like Carrie, were total pros. Uh, some of them, like my husband, were like, I don't get podcasts. I don't want to do that. I'm not sure about this. Um, <laughs> But it turned out great. And now if you're thinking, Meg, that sounds a lot like book club, um, I imagine that's true. I've actually never been in a book club, but I do think it's pretty much the book club model. Um, but I think it's been great for us. It's been a great way to connect around stories and to discover additional podcasts. As Carrie said, it is this really intimate medium. And I think one of the things I really enjoy is being able to hear and experience a story that way. But one of the other things I really love is being able to connect with other people about a super compelling story. I mean, I think that's true of Wind of Change. I think it's true of a lot of the serial podcasts. They're just such interesting. The, we, the ones that sort of tell you a story over 10 episodes, it's usually such a compelling story that I think it's really great to have a group of people to experience it with. So we have met weekly for three years, almost without fail. We're very, very dedicated. It's a real group of A students in that group, I have to say. Everyone does their homework. Um, we've listened to 27 podcasts. We've folded in occasional books and occasional documentaries, but I figure it's around 300 hours of listening of the podcast alone and then like another 150 hours of talking about the podcast. Um, so I think it's a great way to experience them. I would say if you wanted tips on how to do it, I would say a small group is good for Zoom because then everyone has a chance to participate. Um, I think we've gravitated towards uh, nonfiction storytelling, more investigative, although there are a ton of different stories you could opt to listen to in this way. Um, we decide things by consensus, so it's been a great way that when we end one, everyone sort of looks around for another and we throw out a bunch of ideas, so it's been great for discoverability for our group. I think all of us are listening to a lot more different things than we otherwise would. Um, and I think I had another point that I'm now completely forgetting. <laughs> You're just like, every now and then, if you run a podcast, which I, I will say is so much easier than a book club where you have to actually read like a whole book in order to meet, like, um, <laughs> is, which, you know, is great. But uh, you can do this. You can just listen to like a podcast. It can be like under an hour. Then you've got something to talk about. I, we can also say that some podcasts do not hold up to the scrutiny. <laughs> it is true. That is, that, that is exactly what I was going to say, which is that sometimes like uh, the 
pressure to have an hour long conversation on a podcast episode that might that week have only been 28 minutes can be a little much. So you can always alter the cadence and you listen to two or three or whatever. Um, but it has been a really enjoyable pandemic project. And I think a great way to take a medium that is sort of seen as a very individual and solitary and turn it into a more communal experience. And if you're lucky, you can do a podcast made by someone who lives in your town, <laughs> Anderson, and then he'll come to your podcast very kindly. So because podcast things, things are really nice for you. I have to say, it's one of the things I've always liked professionally. So, but that makes a good transition. Would you say, Robert, to talking about? Thank you both very much. No idea about a lot of that stuff. Um, I, I think sort of begin the conversation. Um, the the three of you have all worked in other mediums media and it's kind of interesting that you've landed on this one and i sort of maybe starting left to right maybe kim you would talk about how you went from writing novels yeah. and writing for magazines to uh this one sure thank you um you know i i remember when i first heard about podcasts i thought they sounded really intriguing like i used to make my own radio shows as a kid on on cassette recorders and it was called Rock Talk was my personal show. And um, but it never occurred to me that that was something that I might actually do. And and then so when I heard about podcasts, I was intrigued. But it actually took like the pandemic and January 6th and come up someone coming to me and saying, you know, you I think I think you would be really great to do an investigative piece, like a long form, deep thinking, sort of multifaceted investigative piece on the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And I was just like, oh God, that would be so exciting. And right, like everybody, um, you know, it was like a month after it had happened. And so I was wondering what the hell happened. And it was just the best way to spend the next, like the first, the five episode series that we did specifically on the attack on the Capitol was just like an incredible way to spend that time. And so I was like, I mean, there was not even a question. Like the, the yes came flying that way. And so, um, and and it was it did take some work to learn how to do it a lot of work but it was wonderful I mean I've loved doing it so it was kind of it kind of landed in my lap in a funny way and then I just really didn't do that so. let me back up just for a second should we do the should, should we, we do, do the trailers? trailers yeah just so everybody knows what each of these okay folks does yeah excuse and me and if you were listening on the podcast app although Kirk can tell us about his series we'll listen first to the trailer then we'll get to yours if that's okay because we're just gonna play oh, oh that's so okay. yeah okay. I just start right at the top and fire some people. The best politician of all is Nixon. But boy, when you get in tight and close and he's under attack. President Nixon heard today the voice of the campus in a massive appeal. For he's known as the madman theory. Make those North Vietnamese think that he was just crazy. Here was a fellow who seven years before was the biggest loser in American politics. <laughs> Astonishing. He was a textbook for how to damage our democracy. I have Dr. Kissinger calling you. Nixon was a paranoid. Everybody was told a different story. Mr. President, you are saving this country. I thought this is really what he means, and he's the president. It was a very intense time. I'm Kurt Anderson. I thought I knew the story of Richard Nixon's downfall pretty well. The Watergate break-in, the cover-up, exposed, busted, resignation, the end. But it turns out the true story, the bigger, deeper, underlying backstory, the untold stories, and the monumentally tragic consequences of Nixon's paranoia and lying and ruthlessness all have their roots in the Vietnam War. Nixon at War is our seven-episode documentary series about the long, ugly endgame of America's war in Southeast Asia. You'll hear recordings from the people in the room. This is the interview with Harry McPherson. Presidential phone calls. Senator the president. And our own squad of expert historians and authors. Kissinger was personally involved in instructing the Strategic Air Command to lie about where they were dropping bombs. You'll hear the president and his men scheming and raging in real time about their enemies, especially their enemies in America. They don't want to fight when it's tough. Screw them, because we're in a hell of a fight. You'll hear first-hand oral histories by participants. I didn't have any reservations about bombing Cambodia, but I didn't want it kept secret. You'll hear mysteries unraveled. All this minutia, and then all of a sudden, the bombing halt story. And maybe by the end, like I did, you'll come to a whole new understanding of the damage the war in Vietnam did to America. Nixon at War, from PRX.
wherever you get your podcasts. It's great. So. <laughs> it's great. Mm. Um, okay, and here, can this is your trailer for this? We've all heard a lot about the attack on the Capitol last January 6th. But here's what I want to know. How exactly did it happen? There was a big range of people in the crowd that day. From moms with strollers, to paramilitary groups, to evangelical Christians. Most of them didn't have any history of violence. So how were so many regular people incited to assault the seat of our democracy? What compelled them to scale the walls? break down the doors, beat policemen with flagpoles. We know Donald Trump supporters believed the election had been stolen, but we also know there was no evidence of this at all. So how were all these people made to believe it? There were a lot of factors in play on January 6th. Almost all of them involved propaganda. So how exactly does propaganda work? What's the science behind it? And how can we stop it from destroying our country? From Atomic Well Studios, the control variable. I'm Kim Cutter. Season one investigates the role propaganda played in the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Subscribe now. Really good music. Yeah, really good. Yeah, yeah. Really good. Thank you. Yeah, that one. We had somebody compose it for us. Um, yeah, so it was, you know, I, I think the thing with podcasts that I noticed from the ones I listened to, like a lot of people who listen to Serial was just like, it's just such a good story. I just want to keep listening and listening. And so I think that the the natural story of what, what happened that led up to the attack in the Capitol was just immediately such a good hook for me out of curiosity. Like I wanted to know. And I I wanted to know... I wanted to approach it as an individual and also, you know, as a journalist, but really to just like, there was a level on which like, I just as a person wanted to know. And I um, thought it would be amazing to hear from as many intelligent experts as I could. And so it was really just a great way to kind of do that in a way that would have happened in magazines in the old days or in a not, I mean, it would, it would still obviously happen in a nonfiction book and in tons of magazines, but this was a way to go very deep on a specific topic. And in a kind of like a, a, a kaleidoscopic way um, and that to me seems quite like one of the joys of podcasting is that you can almost create a mosaic and which Kurt's show does beautifully too which um I just find so inspiring and um but uh, it's it's a very creative medium so it, it um it turned out to be a lot of fun should we listen to Emily's and then yeah you went yeah, to in a ridiculously elite world, the Art Career Podcast is breaking barriers by letting you sit in on candid, straightforward conversations with leading art professionals. I'm your host, Emily McElreath, and I've dedicated my entire career to building partnerships in the art community as an advisor, curator, educator, and gallery director. Here at The Art Career, we appreciate you for joining us in changing the art world's landscape to make art more accessible. Each of our podcast episodes explores today's art world practices, serving the community with insights, secrets, and stories. We will speak with famous icons. Sunshine is a disinfectant. Information. People just need information. Those poor fucking souls that are afraid of the word gay or trans. They don't even know the language. What are they afraid of? Why can't the patriarchy share power? Learn about the current market cycles. If the physical art world is its own entity and it functions over here on the left, then NFTs are also its own entity and it functions over here on the right. Don't think for a second that NFTs are just going to take over the physical art world. And as always, challenge the status quo. It's about finding these obscure things that I can shed a light on. Whenever I see people drawing on the subway, I always stop and look. Bars, I love looking at people drawing at bars. Join us each week wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to follow us so you don't miss an episode. We can't wait to build our community. See you soon. Do you want to talk about what drew you to this medium? Uh, well, what drew me to the audio medium, uh, you know, I've been an editor and a writer, especially a, a 
an editor for you know uh, various things and starting magazines and whatnot uh, for uh, almost twenty years. And then, then, then I got fired from my last magazine job, and I said, "Okay, I'm going to write books now, full time, and, and write novels." And that's right. Did my first one, and then, and then, as, as that came out, okay, now I'll write the next one. This is doing okay, and, um, and I, I did, and I kept doing that. But in 1999, uh, the people who were then Public Radio International wanted to and start a weekly show on Public Radio about arts and culture. And I didn't know at the time that public radio, national public radio, and these national producing organizations had tried multiple times before. And, and I didn't know that I would get my career. This show was going to be the last gasp, and they expected it to fail like the other attempts had, had failed. And, and, and out of the blue, they called me and said, Well, we think you, you know, you'd be a possible host for this. I said, and I really, I literally thought like you're the right person because I've I've been interviewed on radio shows, but I've never hosted. And I don't know anything about it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, think so. Anyway, so I I I you know had auditions and interviews and and learned that uh, when they said you know radio is very different. I said yes, yes, I know. I think so. <laughs> and uh, and so they hired me to do this, and we did this show for we did, we started this show, and it was a public radio show. It was. Pretty successful, and and then I remember in, in 2009, I was in Los Angeles teaching for a semester, and uh, some young person said, "Oh, I love your podcast." And I said, and I didn't say, "What are you talking about? I don't have a podcast. I have a radio show." But that was my reaction at the time because podcast can on, uh, And uh, but then I realized, no, that's I shouldn't react that way. And I realized. That's what, well, that's what it was, and, and, and the show embraced that. But what I realized during these great conversations and, and explanations is that uh, when, so I started radio not knowing anything and, and learned something. And, 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 you know, public radio, by then almost 30 years old, had, had been this next species, or this new species, really, of, of, in American radio, of a kind of radio that was less formal and sometimes more conversational and all kinds of different things. And everybody knows what a public radio theater was. It was invented in the 70s and 80s. Right? So uh, what we were trying to do, among other things in our little show, was make it often as great as most much of public radio is. Some of NBR shows in particular were had a certain kind of formal voice that we thought, oh, that's no, don't do it like that. Don't do it like that. Don't, oh, no, no, that's too NPR. It became a thing as we talked about. And what I realized in retrospect is that we were, without calling it podcasting, kind of going to this next evolutionary step of thing, which is more informal, more conversational, more weird, more niche occasion, more all those things. And then so I realized that when somebody say, oh, you're doing podcasts, I said, oh, okay, I guess I am. And then I started listening to a few. And then and then Serial came along and as Carrie said, changed everything. And and to me, it was always wonderful that Serial came out of this American life, this American life being the, you know, the the, the amazing achievement, one of the amazing achievements of the this sort of second wave or third wave, I don't know which way, but later public radio, great, great show. That something as devoted to rigor and care and, and production, everything else as that was the creator of this killer app, you know, was so good for this new medium. So anyway, that we did that, it was great, and then it was too long, and I stopped, and we stopped, and and uh, uh, and and yeah, I did this Nixon War thing, and and it was. And again, so that's what drew me to it. What drew me to it is, hey, you want to have this day job in addition to writing novels? I'm not sure <laughs> if it'll last for a year or two, and that'll be that. Um, but so this guy called uh, Steve Atlas, who had been a WGBH documentary producer and had made, uh, uh, had, was new to the, the you know, limited series podcast and came, came to me with his Nixon idea and all these, this incredible access to and knowledge of all these, all these tapes, these incredible tape libraries, which became the meat of this thing we made about, about Vietnam and, and Watergate and Nixon and, 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 and what, what I had, having never, having occasionally we did documentaries on Studio 360 that I got my hands on and deep, went deep into these hour-long docs. 
But for this thing, I, I thought, oh, this is a good gig. But it became this thing I did so deep and so spent so much time for six months, nine months making in 2020, 2021, when we had nothing else to do. Um, uh, this Nixon Award thing and, and really listened to lots and lots of tape and did lots and lots and lots and lots of drafts and redos. We really made it in a way that I, when with a weekly show, you don't make as or I didn't anyway, as much. And uh, and so yeah, I'm very proud of it, very happy with it. And what I realized, and it, it, again, it relates to what other people said. In, in in the newness of the meeting, which is still you can make it up, you're still it's still being made up as you go along. There are there are ways that it's done, and there are conventions, but like they're they're still a little loose, and, and people can make up something new in a way that you know. 20 years or 10 years or whatever in TV was probably, well, maybe you could still do it 10 or 20 years in TV. But uh, what I realized is that seven, these seven 30, 40 minute episodes on this fairly niche subject with all these tapes, some of which we had to expensively enhance to get to be audible and everything, is so, in a certain way, it's so niche, although it's about America and it's. It has some resonance and, and all of it, you know, it, it's, it's an important thing, but still, it's kind of a niche. And I thought, like, this couldn't have been done without a podcast. This, you know, you would never be able to have four hours of of all this detail about Nixon and and Anna Chanel and all this, all this to me fascinating uh, storytelling and detail. You, you, it just couldn't have existed in the age of. A pre podcast could have existed as a documentary, could have existed as a radio. Public radio would not have put on five shows about this, I don't think. Anyway, and it was so wonderful to be able to do this thing that kind of could have existed before, you know, the last decade. And so it was very, very exciting. And I've done another thing since it was, uh, again, more of a hot job for hire doing these fantastic interviews with people about AI in the future last year. But um, that, no, it's 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 amazing, and and, I'm, and you know, I'm, and you know, now unfortunately, I have these two new podcasts I know about, and I'll have to add to my <laughs> yes, uh, right. my, my follow list. And, but no, and, and again, it's nice in this you know digital age where so much is not person to person, and light is on screens. That in this meeting where there are whatever you said there were seventy seven hundred thousand yes. accent podcasts. I mean, there, there is no, I mean, there are obviously there are ways to learn about new ones, but 90% of new podcasts that my wife and I start listening to are from people saying, hey, you heard this, or, yeah. or have you heard the Patrick Brad and Keith thing, which is <laughs> amazing. Uh, and and it, so it's person to person, in my life anyway, so much of what one hears about rather than like, I mean, going to the newspaper or TV guide or whatever my parents went to to find out. So that's my story. <laughs> um, Emily, you're coming at it from a little bit of a different direction. Um, I, you're coming at you know an art advisor. You're in you're in the art world. Yeah. And various. So it's it's a little bit different than somebody who's telling a specific historical story or, or a journalist story. For sure, I um I'm, I'm fairly new. Uh, we just launched season three, but it's only been a little over a year that I've been working on my podcast. And my backstory, essentially, I was working on various curatorial projects. I was working one on one with many emerging artists. I was working as an advisor. I had my advisory. And as I, you know, really started to dive deep into talking to these artists, I kind of realized like, all right, we're sitting here for hours and I'm giving these artists advice. What do I know? But that's that's what I was doing. And I had several artists say, like, would you ever think of doing some, you know, online course or something so you can basically your reach can expand? And I was like, I have no desire in building an online course. Someone said, why don't you try a podcast? And, you know, I thought about it for about a week. I'm very impulsive. And I decided, you know, I, 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 been very proud of the community I've built over the past two decades in the art world. I'm like, wow, I bet I could score some really interesting people to sit down and talk about what it means to be a creative. And just listening to my trailer, it really needs to be updated because 
we've now expanded to the fine art world, the music industry, theater, um, writers, you know, and I, so basically I approached Marilyn Minter and I was like, look, I have to launch with someone that people know, right? I can't sit down with an obscure artist for season one, episode one, throw me a bone. Like, will you do this for me, Marilyn, please? I've never done a podcast before. This might be awful, but will you do this? And, you know, she invited me into her studio three weeks later. And within 10 minutes of me sitting down with Marilyn, I thought I was going to talk about the actual art she was making. And we soon pivoted into mental health, then self-development and social justice um, and all the things that I really care about because at the end of the day, I don't care what kind of paint you're using on the canvas. And I don't really think people are gonna tune in for an extended period of time to talk about just that. And it just got really intimate, you know, and coming out of the pandemic and being where we are in the world right now, it just felt so damn good to be sitting down. And I prefer to do all my interviews in person. I can't do them all in person, but when I can, you know, it's, I don't know, I was, we were talking, I fell in love with it that day and I've never loved anything more than interviewing people. Um, mm -hmm. So I found my thing and I mm -hmm. continue to yeah. <laughs> do it. Well, that Laurie Simmons is one. Laurie oh, Simmons, yeah. yeah. And she's become a great friend of mine. And she was, everyone's been so generous, you know? Everyone's like, how are you getting these? Probably like Cheryl Strait. I emailed Cheryl Strait, you know, who wrote Wild. I don't know if you're familiar with her. It's like, Cheryl, can <laughs> we throw me a ball? You know, this is, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I love you. Please let me sit down. And She's like, come to Philadelphia in a couple of weeks. You know, people are so generous, you know? And I found that at this point now, I actually have something to show for myself. And so I can send my deck and be like, will you sit down with me and be on my podcast? And I pretty much do everything on my own. I have an editor to do all the techie stuff that I would fail miserably at. But other than that, I'm doing the outreach and um, writing the interviews and Hopefully I'll, I'll be able to afford to hire a few more people down the line, but yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. Um, in your trailer, you mentioned that you're going to expose some secrets. There's so Can many secrets. give us a couple secrets? Oh, God, <laughs> you're putting me. Sorry. Well, I think, you know, sitting down with famous artists and writers, um, et cetera, you know, what I am good at, I will say that, is really quickly getting to know someone on a very intimate level. And soon thereafter, you know, they are talking to me about why they never wanted to become a doctor, okay? Or what their least favorite exhibition was, or their failures and what their most, you know, horrible, vulnerable, heartbreaking failures were, you know, within their career. So I don't really have prime examples of secrets, but it's like that, you know, and secrets come up with things about myself that I didn't know existed, you know, Marilyn started talking during the first episode. I can't believe we left this in about why she didn't want to be a mother, right? And I love hearing women that don't want to be a mother talk about it because this is such a heavy and complicated topic. And she turned it on me. And I had just gotten through two, you know, years of failed IBS, right? And all, I start fucking crying and, and I'm looking at it, this is my first interview ever. And I'm like, this is a disaster, you know? Um, and, and I walked out just being so happy. I was like, all right, so we obviously need to, you know, cut the crying now. And he was like, no, we're not cutting the crying now. And I'm like, all right, so things like that. It's just been so shocking and warm and intimate. Yeah, we love crying in audio. It's mm -hmm. really <laughs> yeah. We're even shorting up. Oh. It's just we love emotions. So. Yeah. Nixon shows up a little bit a few yeah. times in your tapes. 
these monitors tease. <laughs> yeah, how did how do you choose? So, so for uh, the first season, yeah. How did you choose uh, people you interviewed? I, some of them you're close to. I can yes. tell you friends with. Yes. Well, so the first season, the, the interview to the attack on the Capitol um, is a standalone five episode series. And then afterwards, um, we decided to go weekly with it, which was thrilling. And so the show sort of became a more standard conversational show. So for the specifically for the investigation into the attack on the Capitol, I really just thought like, I, I, you know, here I am reading all these weekly magazines and monthly magazines and what, watching some TV, not a whole lot, but about the atomics, right? And there's only so much you can get from the, the pieces that are written in a week or, or, or are written for a weekly or monthly publication. And, and I just kept thinking like, I, there's so much more I want to know and there's no way those mediums can cover them. And so I just like, so I thought, well, okay, I want to hear what, like, I want to hear what, like an expert in propaganda can tell me about this. Like, what can an expert in Nazi propaganda teach me and talk to me about the propaganda that led to the Capitol attacks? And there was a ton. And I happen to have had a, a teacher, actually, my favorite teacher in high school, um, taught me a class about, taught a class about um, Nazi Germany and, and the Holocaust and had taught how propaganda worked. And I remembered it, like I thought about it on the day of the attack on the Capitol when I was watching it happen. I recognized what I was seeing. I was in, when Donald Trump was addressing the crowd before they marched on the Capitol, I recognized all of these tools and I was, it was terrifying. And I just, so I went and interviewed my teacher who was, who was terrifying, right? He was like, I, I'm, so, you know, he, had, he was a refugee from the, um, from the Armenian genocide, where 1.5 million people were killed in Armenia, and um, and so he had his own experience of traumatic genocide, and you know, so I went. And he's 84 now, and I went and found him in Connecticut and spent the afternoon interviewing him, and and so that was a the fact that we had an emotional connection that had been the fact that I loved him. He's my favorite teacher ever, and that he had that his what he taught me had resonated so deeply that it really was something that really played in my head. You know, 30 years later was something that made me think that would be a good interview and so there were things like that right when you think there's a real emotional connection there's this is really the where how my story my engagement with this story really started and then there are people where you just think well like okay can i talk to like can i talk to like a philosopher who might be able to talk about like michael sandel is a harvard philosopher who wrote a book called the tyranny of merit and who writes about problems with our meritocracy in america which is a wonderful thing for meritocracy and it has a lot of problems and um but that like he said yes and it, it was amazing the people who would come and say yes so the creator of mad men came on and we would talk about advertising propaganda and how edward bernays who was um the king of of Ad, he basically totally reinvented the wheel when it came to advertising and um he was Sigmund Freud's nephew and he could speak very brilliant this the guy who created Mad Men could talk very brilliantly about how Bernays the impact that Bernays has had on our culture which is gigantic and um in a way how Donald Trump had used a lot of these tools these propaganda tools that Edward Bernays had sort of like um spread into advertising that had revolutionized the advertising business um through psychological manipulation basically he taught everybody in advertising like here's how you make people hungry to buy stuff and um it, it is what we are all being fed every day and um donald trump also uses a lot of those tools he used a lot of those tool, tools in his campaign in very very undeniable chilling ways just that in a way he would have absorbed just as a businessman just like having, um, because he was a salesman, right? Like he's been selling Donald Trump his whole career. And he's really kind of brilliant at that in, the, in that way and understands how to whet people's appetite and make people think in the way that he talks to them, that he has something that they want, that he can give them something that they want. And the tools that he uses are these tools that Edward, Edward Bernays developed um, in in public relations, they are propaganda tools. And then, I'm sorry, just to go on a second, but Edward Bernays also wrote this book called Propaganda that Goebbels read, okay? Yeah, and it was found on Goebbels' desk, right? And so, you know, and obviously, Edward Bernays was Jewish, right? He certainly didn't intend 
to write a book that would be a massive influence on the Nazis, but he did. And so these tools, looking at how dangerous these tools were, that was something that was fascinating. And I just couldn't have found, that was a story that I could investigate that I wasn't seeing in the media around me. Um, I, could talk to, I could talk to theologians and neuroscientists who were looking at how fundamentalism works in the brain. Um, anyway, it, it went on and on. It was, I followed my curiosities. I really followed and I just thought, what are what are, what are every question I want to ask and who do I want to ask them of? And because in some ways, I think because it was the pandemic and we were all it was the it was the, the winter and spring of 2021, and we were a lot of us were still at home. Everyone said yes. I mean, I spent hours on Zoom. Exactly. And then when we went to the weekly show, it was the weekly show, basically, it, at the end of the five episode investigation, my big question was, okay, so this country is totally divided in a terrifying and so deep-seated way that it's really hard to imagine how we're going to come back from this. It's really because we're so siloed by the media, right? And so people are really, really um, in this very adversarial sort of us versus them popular um, situation, which has been talked about extensively now. But I just think you're thinking like, well, what do we do a show on like, like, can we just talk to a lot of people about like, how, how, what do we do like as a country and as people with our country in such crisis, like with the whole population kind of in this existential, like really scary time that's totally tied in with climate change. And just like there are all these factors that make living on the planet and in America specifically frightening at this time. Mm -hmm. So we kind of expanded. And then it was like, all right, so we can talk Bill Clinton it has an amazing memoir coming out called The Flag Across the Station Wagon. And that is all about how the American car and American, American sort of core fundamental story um, has led to um, terrible racial and social injustice in this country. And it, it, it sort of, it was a similar thing. It was the same questions broadened and taken to people who could speak more deeply to specific subjects. Um, and so like Michael Sandel did the charity Barrett and we had the president of Earth Justice come on and um, Busy Phillips came on to talk about women's rights. And it was really just like, what is big that's happening in this country that's involved with storytelling? That is that like, what are these big effects that are happening as a result of the stories that people are being told in different segments of the world? So. What, what, what's sort of interesting about it is I feel all three of you tried to, there's sort of a reveal going on. There's kind of a, um, you're pulling back the curtain in some, or you're talking about um, how people put the curtain over it and, and how we can right. look back and yes. see underneath that. I think for your mix and maybe what a genius he was, and it took, I don't know, what's it, 50 years or? or yes, and, the, and there's so much material. And if you buy all that, I've seen, I've listened to a lot of YouTube, so I've read all the books. Well, maybe, but yeah. no. <laughs> and you, and you, what I realized to, to an amazing degree is the, 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 the amount of hate of the famous hate, right, has changed. There's this key to this whole water you think. We've, I've heard, we've heard just the tip of that iceberg. And there's so much stuff that gives a sense of these people ask like characters in a novel. That's, I wanted to go on forever and ever. I wanted to have a whole separate podcast on this woman, Anna Shalala. You know, and, and, and so there's this means now, just to say these tapes, these real life, like real tapes from 1968, 1968 through the late 60s and early 70s. You get the sense of these people, you're in the room now. You know whether we're going to have that in the future, but we certainly have it for this period, and, 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 and it's great. Um, so it is that. I mean, and, and again, I hear. I mean, what you do talking to artists for a long time. And it's, you know, I mean, the show we did Studio Three Sixty was a lot of things, but it was like what I did for it was essentially that. You know, and it was, and it, it is, everything you said, I, I agree with. Uh, couldn't agree more. But it's so different. What we got to do, what you get to do, what y'all get to do when you've done this, is just like spend an hour or something. Spend, well, I never spent five hours with anybody, but, <laughs> but uh, and just talk and see what you get, and then and then you cut it apart, and you know, or editor or whatever, as opposed to the seven minutes on radio or seven or four, four minutes or nine minutes on television, which which is you know can be fine as far as it goes, but it is it's that as opposed to just real conversation and this real depth and as you say when, when you you know you know going down what, what is the nature of propaganda and storytelling and 
creating, you know, alternate realities and alternate facts and all that. Well, that's that's a subject that you know that's a subject, and 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 absent this medium, this right. uh, you, you, you can't do that. Really, you can do a media show, right. I suppose, but it's you very, couldn't really do the deep, nerdy, no, fascinating exactly. investigation. No. Right? no, it is among other things. Podcasting is a nerd. Maybe a couple more quick questions. Then open it up. I'm sure everybody's got questions, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about the word leadism that you use. And and um, because I think a lot of us who either are in the art world or have elements of the art world realize that a lot of the market is based on a kind of elitism, or at least what it seems like it. And I'm interested in um, how you're, again, pulling back the curtain a little bit about that and revealing the human beings that are involved. Sure. Um, and, and that's just it. What I wanted to do was pull back that curtain and make the art industry, when it started out, it was just going to be about fine art, right? Make it more approachable. I did uh, my first live interview at NYU with Jerry Saltz for the launch of season three, and he completely disagreed with me about the artwork. I'm like, Jerry, of course it isn't for you, you know? Um, and we disagreed on that. But yeah, I mean, look, it's... The fine art industry and other industries, but but mostly the fine art industry. You know, you walk into a gallery in Chelsea as an outside. Even I used to walk into galleries in Chelsea when I was working for Peter Brandt, right? And feel completely overwhelmed and intimidated and scared to act, right? And, I, and, you know, so I've been talking about this with peers and colleagues and I've always just had a really um, forward, approachable um, way of interacting with the art world. And so I kind of, but yeah, I mean, I stick to that, you know, it really, it is, it's, and it's changing, right? We're changing a lot of things in the fine art world, especially, but I mean, look, still, now that we're finally paying interns, right, you we're only seeing really wealthy people working in the galleries because who can afford an internship without getting paid? And then who can afford to be paid $25,000 a year to work at a blue chip gallery? Well, we know who can afford to do that, right? And so it just, yeah, it's, so the elitism is, is there and people like Jerry Saltz, hopefully myself, and so many others are making it, you know, so much more approachable through an intimate lens that hasn't really existed. Does that answer your question? I have a question. <laughs> Since you mentioned money, and yes. happily, this hasn't talked about the business of this thing. And as Karen said, it's free to do. Well, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's free to do. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Well, it takes time, and you know, if you have to hire somebody to actually make the thing, like yeah, sure. you do, yeah, you know, something. Um, you know, and, and some people make a lot of money doing podcasts. Um, do either of you sell uh, ads? You sell ads? I have just yeah. okay. embarked on that journey. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, it's it's worth. I mean, I have to, to answer your question, yes. like, this is all out of pocket. Yes. I don't spend, I mean, but I pay my edit. It's all out of pocket. Yes. I am making no profit on my podcast and I have to, and right. I plan to, and I will, right. but yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, that's a yeah. whole new can of worms that I'm. No, and, and work, you know, some, you know, some things like the Nixon thing took a lot of work and I wasn't going to go to the. Library in Austin and the library. Sure. And it's been, you know, good, I suppose, but uh, hours and hours and hours and days and days and days saying, here's the tape I think. You know, I mean, there, it, it requires other people, unless everybody is a saint or a rich person. Sure. Uh, you know, money is. Yeah. You have to eat. And there's so much research that goes right. into right. Right. every single interview or story you're telling. I mean, that's, that's for sure. Now there's these new, you know, I'm working for the first time at Tink Media. They're kind of a podcast. I don't know. They're one of the few podcast marketers, but you know, now there are these like record labels that are essentially picking up right. podcasts. Right. And I'm like, let's get me a record label. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's where I am. I'm kind of like looking 
for that. But again, you have to have a certain amount of numbers for anyone to even look at you or really good content, right? There's so much here. Yeah, I was gonna do it. Let's let's who paid for the project. The national down payment is your tax dollars paid for. Nice. <laughs> and did that Great. um compete with the history of your career economically? Did that was that enough? Well, they didn't give me the millions of public radio. I've had on podcasts that have been paid. Oh, so you made them or you've never, never made them? Oh, speak of nobody. Oh, I don't but pay. Me too. No, yeah, I know. I'm not sure how the sausage is made exactly. Yeah. Well, the sausage is there's 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 different sausages. Exactly. Yes. There's, there's high end. Uh, well, what what sausage 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 sausage. Give me an example of a high end and how that's funded. Well, I mean, I mean, they're funded. I mean, Joe Rogan, you sell a gazillion ads on uh, Spotify and. He makes a gazillion dollars. That's how that's fun. It's like anything else, like TV, like you know, Howard Stern, yeah. whatever yeah. things I'm interested and then, in. And then, and then, and then there's just the little ones who are funny. I mean, many of them, you know, there are lots of successful, there's lots of lots of podcasts that people make living is doing and, mm -hmm. and sell ads, and it's like traditional uh ad-based media. There, 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 I pay for one. I mean, I'm sure there are many that are worth paying for, but I pay for Pink Bahara and Joyce uh Bates. Yeah. Um, Joyce Vance is a, 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 a you know legal weekly podcast because it's nice to do. And and uh, and I'm sure there are others that may have a subscription. Thing. I have a subscription yeah. program within my podcast. I don't really push it that much. I'm going to, but yeah. <laughs> I, I need to. People people ask for a voluntary Patreon. Yeah, and then I have thing. you know I've done work with so many artists that I do this new thing called like office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right. right? Whatever, whatever. Right. And I have to build upon that. But there's that. There's that. Other than the ads, if you start a subscription program, it's basically from a business lens. You're creating some, a lot of people are creating free content to put out there to then set something, right? That's behind not your podcast. Yeah, no, not mine, but that is behind a lot of them. And then I would say there's the other thing, which uh, it, it seems to me like the podcast, the weekly podcasts that are wildly successful, where people are actually like making a lot of money, like yeah. Joe Rogan and or the New York Times or the New York Times or so or daily, make money. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. or like the like, yeah. crime podcast are like wildly yeah. popular and. Um, comedy podcasts are really wildly popular, but it seems to me like mostly what's happening there is that not with news, but with like Joe Rogan or with Glennon Doyle who does Untamed. Like yeah. you, it's a weekly show versus bi-weekly now, but basically she she's the brand, right? Joe Rogan is the brand. Yes. People want to hear Joe Rogan. They they like right. They want to like they want to hear his take on the world. They think he's funny and smart. They want to hear they mm -hmm. like the people he interviews. And so I, it seems to me that so far the podcasts that make money are doing that. Yeah. Um, and so in a way it's like Oprah, but like twice a week. It's all branded. It really it's is. All it's branded. like people have to want to see you. Yeah. It is, it is personality. You can't be a duck. I, do you, like, please disagree with me. Cause I mean, I don't know if I'm maybe you know, maybe I can actually I also teach people that want to share your podcast. Okay. 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 You can say that actually that in the world, if you're listening to a podcast, you'll sometimes hear host read ads versus right. just generic ads. And I'm getting a lot more generic ads, which sound a lot like commercial radio when I'm right. listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. Public like radio that. was this mortifying thing that I just was shocked that everybody accepted over there. Everybody accepted there's, there's, there's Malcolm Gladwell reading ads. Yeah. <laughs> Those are what, you know, actually there's, uh, they just had, they actually have like uh, podcasting upfronts. I think they just had them this week in New York and it's essentially like TV upfronts where they bring out their new slate of shows or they're trying to sell ads against it. And it's just uh, like the idea of getting the host read ad is what everyone wants to get. That's like, because people take action on these ads. And when I teach us, I'm always like, I used to think that wasn't true and that I wasn't susceptible to advertising, but of course when I was like sleeping on a cat Casper pillow and I had like a quick toothbrush and I was wearing me undies and my bomb of socks. And I've heard about all of those brands on podcasts. And they're just like, it's like, it's like your friend recommending something to you. You're already spending all this time with them and you're like, oh my gosh. And this is what like Joe Rogan, I think sells a bunch of supplements, you know? And it's like, I could be like Joe Rogan if I took his supplements, you know, it's so it's well, yeah. it's The gentleman with the hat has a question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, three reasons brought me here. I live in Cornwall. So yes, yes. to Cornwall. And recently there was a, a hybrid library, but let me produce a hybrid event poetry where there were poets from around the world, poets from around the nation, poets in this room, 
and the whole thing went out live and it's going to be on their thing. I spent the last two years of my life trying to produce a thing called the Human Room Open Voice, which goes back 20 years. And it is a social media platform as a work of art that is of and for and by the people. I recently just started my very first podcast called The Word Show, which is not released yet. And all of you are going to be in, well, how do you say that? Please do me a solid. <laughs> We're going to be on it's a round table about free speech. And, um, and it's focused. So those three things brought me here. But the question I have for you guys, and you could pick one each maybe, uh, is do you know what the smith munt Act is from, I think it was the 30s or 40s? And do you know that when Obama was president, he signed the smith munt Modernization Act, which made propaganda legal in the United States to lie to the American people with propaganda because our democracy and tell the truth, but they don't. So to make it fair, they gave the multinationals a right to produce news as propaganda. And it was called the Smith Mund, I think it's M-U-N-D-T. Modern is a very important thing. And I think that should be covered by all of you, if not anyone. Um, and do you, when I was younger, I realized uh, what was happening with media and, and thing. And, if you could we'll say something about media saturation as a disinformation campaign. And um, the thing that motivates me is if somebody tells me I can't ask a question, I certainly have a reason to live. Thank you very much. <laughs> Peter, you have a question. Um, I, I've heard most of you say what a deep dive you were able to do in this medium. And I'm just, as an outsider, I'm just interested in you all having learned the medium, learned to work with it. It struck, it struck me as surprising, especially for those of you who are writers or novelists or journalists, because you can, part of me wants to say, well, surely you can go deeper in a long form piece of journalism. You could go on chapters and chapters in terms of quantity and specificity the material you can bring up. So maybe even back to your, your initial uh, presentation, is it what you're saying is that in this medium, you can do a deep dive in the intimate context of spoken word? And yeah. so it's a sort of mm -hmm. hybrid attempt, yeah. as opposed to I can go really deep in a way that you can't even in a book, for example. I just want to. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to imply in any way that you can't go as deep and deeper in a book. It's just that, um, well, first of all, the, the conversation, the performative aspect of it is really fun. It's yeah. really, really lovely to like, as somebody who likes listening to podcasts and radio, it's really fun to interview people and hear their voices and take people on that journey that is with words, but that is not on the page, but that's coming into your ears. I mean, I just liked that myself. And so I was excited to make something like that. Sure. And then I also feel like, um, you know, you can put them out faster. So you can respond like it's, it's like you can you can spend as long as you want or as short as you want. And so you can be you don't have the lead time that you have with the book. With the book, you, you hand it in and it, it you know comes out a year later, right? No matter what. And best case scenario, though. And so I guess unless you're very famous, but or <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, but it really is um you can respond deeply more quickly. On a podcast, and that was my my part of my interest. And uh, that's exactly right. I mean, newsy, and yeah. even a five thousand word piece right. takes it's a lot longer than a week. Yeah. Or oh two. yeah. Right. But there's also the thing you can do like with Nixon War, which is like these tapes that otherwise right. you don't want to read. Right. But you know, to hear is a whole other thing. So there are not, and that's just one example. There are other examples where where music, where where. Um, you know that wouldn't be as good in print right you know? and like so there are things that audio can do um i keep looking at this podcast expert that's in the audience here for speak as well um uh uh but no there's okay but and, and i think the other thing is you can do a thing this week yeah that more responds to something this month yeah. or now right that, right you don't want to wait for a book to do it. Yeah, and you also, and I, I should just also add to what you're saying about the fact that you can also like, I mean, I with the with the five episodes that contained a, a contained segment on the on the propaganda, I wrote all of those scripts. They sound like I'm just talking, but the you know those are really painstakingly crafted scripts where you have to literally like 
bring pull out all the stuff, all the good stuff out of the transcripts and sew the narrative around it. And but then what's fun too? So that kind of liked that piece work. And then also like saying, okay, let's get a clip of this here and like let's put this kind of music here. And you know, there it it's it is very creative in a way that um that that I found very exciting. Um and yeah, so I love that too. It's, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, the New York Times and some of the other online journals I would normally read, you know, the paper, they're now putting how long it takes to read I know. Um, yeah. a little note, which is really, <laughs> well, it, it, I don't read that fast, but it also, it, it's sort of saying, don't worry, this won't take long, uh -huh. which is such a Probably. different way of looking. It's true on the internet, you don't know when things end, and so I think they're also trying to say, like, this has an end. The expert, thanks for everybody that was Good, it's good to have Kurt Paul one an expert. That's good. Um, but uh, uh, so I'm Don McKinnon, I live in Cornwall. And, um, you know, what you guys were just talking about of like the podcasts that are successful are famous people or true crime. Um, and uh, and I think that, you know, like as a pod, so I, um, I, I think, you know, and news, news is good, and news. But but there's something about like standing in a bookstore and uh, how are, like the discoverability of podcasts, which you talked about earlier, is related to the fact that there are gems of incredible like the beauty of, of podcasts is that there are this incredible diversity of voices talking about this infinite array of topics. Any you know the. Uh, I like your embarrassment of Nisha's line. I will steal it. Uh, <laughs> and yet, the, dis the discovery threshold of podcasts is incredibly high. And really, so, I created a not a podcast during uh, during COVID. I created an app uh, during COVID called Hark Audio, and it was really based on feeling like, you know, if the beauty is the diversity, we're all handed these apps that feel like they were designed for us to follow three shows and listen to them for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And, you know, and we're all desperately doing what Kurt said, which is going to our friends and going like, yeah. you know, and, and we all get that text that says, OMG, you got to listen to this. And it's like a 53 minute podcast episode. And if I text you a song, you can decide in 10 seconds if you like it. If I text you an article, you can skim it a little bit, but but pod, it's like you signed me up for a seminar, right? And mm -hmm. yet there's a moment that's buried in every long podcast episode. There are many, but there's often a moment that is the reason they texted it to you, which is that moment of genius where an idea is ex exposed or you know conversation happens that unfolds. And so um, I created this app that's basically let's build an entire listening experience out of the genius moments of podcasts. Um, let's let's mixtape them. So we create podcast mixtapes by theme around January 6th. We have, and then we have hosts, great podcasters host them. So the best moments of George Saunders on podcasts, who's genius in podcasts. Yeah. Uh, and it's hosted by Susan Orlean. So she's setting you up for all, you know, the moment from the Paris Review podcast where he talks about how as a working for his dad as a chicken restaurant delivery service driver standing in people's living rooms, waiting for them to get their change was what helped him become a great writer, um, trained him to observe. So I just think like that, I'm working on, and then we also now did a deal with Starbucks where if you have a Starbucks app, you live in Cornwall, so there's no reason you would. But if you did, if you did, so every day in the Starbucks app, we curate a podcast moment that you know 30 million people a week use that app and Jad Abumrad, who we brought out of retirement to host, <laughs> um, uh, sets it up and introduces it. So I think it's an amazing medium. I think it's being held back a little bit by the lack of discoverability. Wow. I don't know if any okay. you guys have. I'm sending a follow-up email to everyone with these podcast recommendations and with your permission. I love your site. So like we could include that so people can uh, get to get that awesome. access. But I agree. Great. It's really cool. You're pulling that like top lining sort of the, the best parts of the podcast so you can get, and then if you like it, you can let us subscribe or follow or whatever. Exactly. You can so. dive right into the full episode and follow the podcast. Yeah. That's great. That's John Lewis Jackson, and thank you. Um, I would like to pull out a little bit out of three of you because I noticed, and maybe I'm wrong, because we had trailers, which gave us an idea of uh, the final. And we have you here sitting live, and what we don't that the personalities that come out live here 
are much more vibrant and much more lively. And the performance of presenting your podcast, you seem to be very controlled, <laughs> conscious of the performance part. And uh, so what I'd like to hear is your reflections on how you see yourself in presenting your own material as, as calling voice actors, just for lack of a better word. So this man, uh, yeah, um, yeah. this is how I sound on my podcast. Pretty much like this it really is. is my personality, right? I mean, and I think that's what makes my podcast accessible. And that's what makes my, you know, there's no, and I, and I started my first interview with that control and quickly I was like, what is, what is that? I don't want to listen to that control. You know, I Maybe think all of our trailers just, sound more. Oh yeah, my trailers, charity. And they're more being sort of just the main yeah, song trailer. Right. Yeah. 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 It's fair. I mean, it's a yeah. commercial version of it. Right. Rather than just having a yeah. yeah. more halting conversation. Yeah. 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 I mean, because I, I do think that like all of us have a pretty more. playful, <laughs> like, all of us have a pretty playful approach to our I know that. I like, do. You have to, you have to have fun with it. And I, I, the best advice I ever got, if any of you do a podcast, the best advice I got about delivery is like put a smile on your voice, like you have fun with it. And um, and so I, I think that honestly, yeah, if you're not having fun with it, you're probably not, you're not going to. Can you answer something about the music choices that you make? Because you, everything you do, you do yourself or you choose. Well, I mean, I have to tell big names. Yes, yes. Are... It was my, I, I, I told them what I wanted and then told them Rick to go and brought, and then I, you'll say and yes or no. And yeah. And what you use is uh, music that has not been performed before. Yeah, we had somebody compose the theme, right? And um, and we went through a bunch of albums before we arrived at that one. And that, it felt like it needed to be serious. I mean, it was, it, the show, it, 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 for a fair amount of the show, it is fairly serious, but it's playful. I mean, I, I was always very engaged. I am always very engaged with it. And it's playful. It, I mean, it, it's playful when it can be, if that makes sense. Um, but the overall tone suits the music in the sense that, like, we are at a terrifying moment in in American democracy, right, and in the world. So I didn't want to like. It felt appropriate to the subject matter. Choosing the podcast music yeah. is yeah. Yeah. It was like there's I don't. Finally, I was like, that's fine because <laughs> there was no. I was on a budget. There was only a certain amount. I don't love it at all. It's going to change. I'm listening to it here. Like, this is really, really bad. <laughs> However, you're on, you know, um, yours is amazing. Yeah. I had to throw a fit. I mean, <laughs> the, the first it's couple really of uh, Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's a, that's a very difficult thing to choose. But it sets an important tone, right? It does. Find that as an additional tool and not just your own voice or the voices sure. you can bring in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between like a fiction fantasy dialogue podcast and just an audio book? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't have a scale. I, I learned this song. You, you mean, uh, well, none is the answer, I guess. I mean, I would say, I mean, again, I guess it depends on how some of one or two that I've heard play with audio effects and audio as part of the storytelling that a lot of series well can't do. But beyond that, I mean, I mean, script, most scripted dramatic fiction podcasts that I've heard are uh, audio books. Yeah. Yeah. But they're much more alive because I listen to Audible. But yeah, yeah, audio books yeah. are not produced. Audio books are an actor reading. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now you're getting the audio books too that are like really sound rich and yeah. so, so it's like there's a, there's a little bit of a hybrid crossover. You can like play. There's, there, you can. And I feel like, you know, there's this famous radio cast that Orson Welles made called um, War of the Worlds. And he, he convinced like millions of people that, that the planet was being attacked and bombed fake and news. The first fake news. It's amazing yeah. because it's, it's it was. not yeah. it was fake news but it, it, it's fiction right but nobody knew it was fiction but it also is just totally like you, you it sounds like it's real broadcasting and the, there are amazing sound effects and there are fake interviews and yeah. so he created a whole immersive experience there and you could do that in podcasts with fiction and that would be amazing and there might be probably there are people doing yeah. that right now sure yeah, yeah. No, like, yeah. So there's that. You could really like you can emerge your viewer, or immerse your viewer in a very profound way that is just more like multi-sensory than than the money. Yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. Listeners, yeah. 
Sure, you had a question. Oh, well, it was more, I guess, an observation, but I was listening to all of you. And it seems like a recurring theme in this whole podcast um, generation was COVID. Like that Kurt said, if it hadn't been for blank, 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 then I wouldn't have done my podcast. And when I didn't even hear what you said because I was thinking if it hadn't been for COVID, like, and it just seems like that isolation played a big part in the need to have a connection to the outside world. I think it was happening before then. Yeah. I do think the couple things that were amazing about COVID is that first of all, on the radio side, you saw radio broadcasters like so quickly move to being able to make their entire show at home. But that at home part suddenly meant too that you can get guests from all over the world. It's There's technology. actually a very good software now. Yeah, where it sounds it's not just Zoom, but like the way that we've been talking to each other, you can get people like you, it, it, that accessibility has broken open something else in this and it's made it so much easier. But at some point I meant to say too, you know, just because we're talking about lots of podcasts, we're talking about like really heavily narrative podcasts and interview podcasts. There's all there's all these different types. There's a fiction podcast, there's there's a chat cast, which is like very popular, all the slate gap fest podcasts, which are excellent and really good. There's also just single voice, like somebody talking into a microphone about something they're really knowledgeable about, like hardcore history or uh, you must remember this. There's just so many, there's kind of as many different types. And I do think in the the we saw a lot of like um, <laughs> men in their basements making podcasts about sports for a long time, just to be totally gendered. And uh, and there's still that, but now there's like this other production level that people are doing that's, I don't know, super cool and, and more international too. Yeah. Well, one more lady in the back. Okay, yeah, this is a really question to the, the audio book. You know, I, I've been making documentary films for 30 years and this is so jealous. <laughs> I, mean, I want to know why is it that a podcast has just taken off so much? I mean, they're really the same, they're stories. Yeah. The cheap. Why? Cheap. Yeah. cheap. And anyone can make one. And distribution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. distribution, right? It's easy. Yeah. But also, you can Instant. do it while you're doing something else. <laughs> You can like you can drive and listen to it, or you can garden and listen to it, or you can cook dinner, and you can't. It's just harder to do. I think that it, that's why podcasts have that like edge over over you know either reading a, a hard copy of a book or watching a film of any sort. I think you can do it while you're doing other things. Like it's mobile. Public radio versus television. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Shopping, you know. But also documentarians. I've been training so many documentarians to make podcasts. It's like and a lot of TV, there's a lot of like through line now for podcast stories that are getting sort of tested. Mm -hmm. Like a Hollywood will pick it up and then, you know, it'll become a you know, film or, a, you know, a, um, one of those yeah, serialized things on Netflix or something. But it's tested in podcasting because it's cheaper to make. Yeah. And you can see if the narrative works, even though they're different. I think they're not always that good, but they're, <laughs> they're different mediums. We have one more. Yeah. I'm really interested in the creative factor that. I hear, but I haven't really heard of anyone talk about it specifically. It's the serendipity of the interview, the best interview. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have your script, but then you have someone ask you about it. You want to be from it, and yeah. it all changes. And yeah, yeah. All yeah. I should tell you though that these are two different kinds of um, podcasts that we're yeah. talking about. Like the ones where I'm talking about having a script, yeah. that's um, I do all the interviews beforehand. And I do all the research beforehand, and then I, pay, yeah, I cut and paste it all together and make that's the script, right? And so then you're so you're narrating through snap, uh, snippets of of or, or like sections of interviews, whereas she's having just straight up conversations. Still, when, I, when my show went weekly, I started doing that too. And yeah. yes, there is. Still, I mean, still, how I approach it is I do my whole thing. So like you're just a uh, uh, what do you call it? More of a conversation. Is like a piece of the door. You do something off script, on, it's not impromptu. There's a term oh, yeah. that you know, that's I go into each interview knowing what I'm going to ask, having done all yeah. of my research, having, a lot. and then that, you know, the questions sometimes I get to them, sometimes I don't. But it's always, there's always an outline. I'm far too much of a, I'm not just going in like, let's talk. Plus, don't you cut the boring stuff out? Yeah. Like the, like when you, do you, do you know editor? Oh, oh yeah. What well, boring stuff? Yeah. Everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
to be able to go in for the people you're interviewing too. Like, look, if there's something that really made you uncomfortable that right. you said, exactly. or all you said, no, it's really you take it out. Or just listen to yeah, it. It's, it's like making a documentary. Yeah, yeah, so you go out and do a bunch of interviews yeah. and turn it together to win scripted. Right. It's long. Yeah. Harry, uh, give us one recommendation why. Other than anything, just one. Just one. The daily. If you don't listen to the podcast, you should start with the daily. It's fine. It's true. Yeah. What are you going to say? Start with Window Change. Start with Window Change. Yeah. Come back to me. I don't know. We just discovered, we're trying to discover the logo. We discovered this. It's an interview show called The Brace. Sean Eiling is a He's, it's, it's, he's, he's not a philosopher, but it's about philosophy. Yeah. He talked, we listen, I listened to it. He, he, he interviewed this Princeton philosopher who recently, uh, at 50, started taking acid and psilocybin. And he talked about how it's changed his whole notion of philosophy and existence. And it's great. Anyway, so that's, that's one that's great. <laughs> I mean, I have so many. One that I've, I've listened to a couple. My partner listens to Dopey. It's a podcast about... Basically, it's a, I believe, two sober guys, one who has passed away during the making of this podcast. Um, and it, they just interview people about their stories and their, you know, drug escapades and what has, you know, it's a sobriety podcast that tells some really funny, amazing stories, you know, that's. I was our waiter at Katz's Deli one time. And he was like, Oh, you teach people my guests? Like, I got a funny guess. It's called Duke. It's good. It's a really, really good, good job. job. <laughs> I mean, if you, I thought of one. If you haven't heard S Town, Shit Town, oh, which is really from Serial. But it is so it's from produced by Serial, but it's its own whole, like, I don't know how many episodes it is, 11 or something. It's a lot. It is amazing. And it is, that's our it's song. Yeah, 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 it's a very good one. That's awesome. So I'll add a movie and I'll add a it, Yeah, she talks about that. I'm glad none of us said a true crack because I am addicted to true crack. Oh, oh, so oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not true crack. It's not true crack. It's not true crack. Okay. I'll have to check it out. You know what? My favorite murder. That's like one of the most popular podcasts. I'm trying to avail myself that way. True crack. I'll do the MC program. Yeah, we did there. I think one of my favorites is Great Women Artists by a woman named Katie Hessel. And she's also just published a book called The History of Art Without Men. Oh, that's that great. That's great. Yeah. So it changes the whole canon. Second one is called The Poog, and it's a knockoff of Goop. And it's two women talking, just talking about their lives. And they're sort of 30 something, nice. and there are ads in it, the, the product placements. It's very, very funny. But are they like joking about wellness? I mean, they're oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that sounds great. That well, sounds great. Really, that's really simple. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. <laughs>